Thank you. Well, first off, uh, thank you so much for staying awake. My goal in life right now is just to try to wake everyone up that's currently sleeping with your eyes open. Uh, and we're going to talk a little bit about architecture here. So one of the uh, big things that comes up, and I think the city of Rome is a, a great way to look at this, is how do we design something so it's going to stick around for a while and we can maintain it and it actually works and those type of things. And if we think of uh, the city of Rome, I happen to do a, my, I think, fourth tour, because you never get tired of seeing Rome. I don't know, maybe if you live here you do, but for us that don't, it's just awesome. So I'm walking around the Colosseum, and I'm going, let's see, this thing was built, I think, around 70 AD, and it still stands. That's actually a picture I took yesterday, uh, or Saturday. And can you imagine the work that went in to planning something that can last basically, you know, almost 2,000 uh, years now? Think about our software, we're happy if it lasts like three years, right? And so that's pretty crazy architecture. And you know, what tools did they have? Well, I don't think back then they had, at least that we know of, uh, laptops. But they had paper, we know that. And as a developer, there's actually no better tool to plan your applications than paper. Or there's this really ancient tool you could use. And this ancient tool we call a whiteboard. And uh, some of you may or may not use it, but it actually works really well. And we're going to talk about some things that we probably should plan for. So if we were going to build something on here, like the Coliseum, that it's going to stand. Maybe not 2,000 years uh, technology-wise, but hopefully a little bit longer than a few months. All right, so for those that don't know me, my name is Dan Wallin. Uh, as Leonardo mentioned, I live in Arizona in the United States. That's on the West Coast. Super excited to be here, love coming to Rome, awesome city. Um, but here's what we're gonna talk about. If you think about building uh, some of the different structures that are out there across the city uh, today, you know, you'll see these kind of big pillars oftentimes. And so we're gonna talk about a few of those. Number one, what are you doing to plan your applications? All right, you've heard several great talks today, uh, but if you're gonna jump into any of those technologies, what are you actually doing to plan for that? Uh, whether it's capacitor, or TensorFlow, or uh, Fabian covered uh, shared libraries, things like that, is something we need to plan for. So we're gonna talk briefly about that. We're also gonna get in uh, to how do you organize your modules? This is probably the number one sticking point, I think, especially when uh, people are newer, is how do they actually organize the modules in such a way that we're set up for the future. And I'll give a couple stories on that when we, uh, when we get there. How do we structure our components? Uh, quick show of hands, how many have a pretty deep hierarchy of parent and child components? Anybody have this going on right now? To be honest, I can't really see you anyway because of the light, but hey, I'll assume somebody raised your hand. Um, well, there's some challenges that come up there. So we're gonna talk about a pattern you can do there. And then we're also going to talk about some component communication techniques for more involved scenarios. Now, those that came to the workshop yesterday, we talked about this for about a day. I'm going to cut that down to about 40 minutes, and we could go on for days on all these topics. Uh, but we'll squeeze in as much as we can as we get going here. Now, another big one we need to plan for is state management. And we're going to talk about, do you always need state management? I'm going to say no. Uh, there are plenty of applications that need it, and there's plenty that probably don't. And we're going to talk about some other alternatives that you could use. More of being aware of what's available, so that when we do it, we're picking the right tool for the right job. And then finally, uh, I'll just briefly mention a few optimizations that hopefully if you've been doing Angular very long, you know about these. But if you don't, it's little things that once you look into it, you have a much better understanding of how it works so that you can optimize your app uh, that much more and design it properly from the very beginning. All right, so let's jump on in here. Now, for those that are about to doze off, I'll challenge you to count the number of hidden Angular logos. I'll give you a hint, there's one. <laughs> uh, you didn't know it, but back in the Coliseum days, they actually had an Angular flag hanging down. I bet you didn't know that part of history, did you? All right, that's new. All right. 
So let's talk about application planning. Um, so first off, what concepts do you currently consider if you're starting a new project, like a greenfield project, or maybe you're doing a, a, what we call brownfield project? Uh, you're converting another app or something like that. Uh, I talked to a few people yesterday at the workshop, and they had some really old stuff that they needed to convert to uh, Angular. How do you do that? Well, we're going to talk about some of the planning steps here. Now, those that came yesterday, you do have my permission to take a nap for a little bit. The rest of you, you got to wake up, though. All right, so first off, there's nine main areas that I like to uh, plan for. Number one, you, of course, need to know the app overview. Okay, that's a, I, we would hope you know that, because if you don't know that, I don't know what you're building, right? Number two here. What are some of the app features that you're going to have? Now, this is going to be, that sounds kind of like, well, that's stupid. Of course you have to do that. Well, this is going to get really important as we talk about modules. So we'll get into that again. Number three here, what about security? Now, we know that Angular or any front-end application can't be the source of security, so we better start having that conversation about what is the server side going to do, and is it going to pass anything like groups or roles, username, uh, profiles, things like that. And we better have that discussion early on in this application. Now, moving on, what are some of the domain rules? These would be like your business rules. But what I often find here is that as a front end developer, we kind of think in our little bubble. Now, some of you are probably full stack. And you might be doing uh, Java or Node.js, .NET, Python, something like that. And if you're doing both, then you're probably a little more comfortable with what's possible on the server side versus just the front end. The point of this is to have a discussion with the group, though, on what are the rules we're going to run. And if they're super complex, maybe computa computationally complex, where are we going to run those? It might be more appropriate to run those on the server side than on the client side, for example. It just really depends. But it's a good discussion. A big one that I see a lot of applications that, for my company, we go in and work with a lot of companies. And uh, some are doing Angular, some aren't. But regardless of the front end technology, a kind of lost art, I think, is logging those errors that occur. Uh, any of you that have to deal with help desk, uh, tickets, things like that, that can be a little bit of a challenge when here's the ticket, it says, I clicked on the button, and it didn't work. And you go, great. Like, I, I can find that needle in the haystack, right? It's pretty challenging, actually. So we need to have robust logging, whether it's to a cloud. For instance, you could use uh, Azure App Insights, or AWS, or Google Cloud, whatever it may be. Maybe you can't use the cloud. Then we need some type of logging on the server side that we could handle that. So a logging service, uh, Fabian gave a great talk today. That would be a great example of a shared library, right? where we have a shared library. Every single project in the company, we import that module. And boom, we have logging. We can inject that service. And now every time we have an error, we're going to have all these details that we can get. So that's big. How are we going to talk? Now, most of you would probably say HTTP. And, and, and of course, that's pretty normal. But some of you might have real-time data. If you have real-time data, you might be using WebSockets. We should have that discussion as well. All right, moving down to the last three minimal things that I like to consider. What are we going to send over the network, over the wire, as we send data from the server down to the client? Now, some of you uh, probably use what we call DTOs, data transfer objects. Some of you maybe have an API you don't own, you don't control. Therefore, you get all this data that you don't really need, but that's what you get. Well, in that case, on the front end discussion, what are we going to do to map that data to what the views need? That's a good discussion to have. But if you do control the APIs, probably a better discussion is what can we do in the API to make it more efficient and architect it in such a way that we're not sending useless data that this application doesn't need. Now, of course, that depends on your API. And then finally, last two here. What are your features in the application? Because that's going to relate to modules. And last but not least, what's the shared functionality? Now, Fabian talked a little bit about that again. 
Uh, so I'd refer you back to that talk on shared libraries. But what's just shared in the application itself? Let's have this discussion. Now, what I do to have these discussions is use this like super ancient tool, <laughs> Google Slides. And you're gonna laugh and go, really, you use Google Slides to plan? It actually works great. I've done it with many companies, and here's why. If we were all in the room, like a boardroom together, meeting with maybe the client stakeholder, everybody can contribute. So as we're now talking about these nine areas, First off, we're going to be very focused. Second off, as we talk about this, everybody can contribute. So nobody's hopefully bored that way and just sitting there. Uh, and I've done this with many different groups, as mentioned. It works phenomenally well to keep everybody on the same page. And then there might be some other things, right? Uh, yesterday at the workshop, I mentioned, for instance, uh, accessibility. That might be another thing you need in your app. Uh, internationalization. Well, that might be another thing you need, and we can go on and on, UX and things like that. These are the minimum that I always go through, and then I let the company kind of drive uh, from there. All right, now let's say that we've planned our uh, app. Uh, how are we gonna organize our modules? Now, there's a company in the US, it's a big multi-billion dollar company that I worked with, and they had a big marketing app. And uh, those in the workshop, sorry, you heard this story too, but um, they, had a deadline to meet, they were newer to Angular, and as a result, they just had to, you know how it is. You're given a deadline, I, hey, you gotta have this done by you know, March of some year, and you do what you can to meet that deadline, even though you're kinda coding going, I sure hope this is right, because I'm not really sure, but you just try to get it going, right? Well, that's kinda what they did, and then the app got popular, and it grew, and grew, and grew, and before they knew it, they had a single module that had everything. Now, those that have been building Angular apps much are hopefully doing a feature-based approach for your architecture, where every feature, at a minimum, is gonna have one module. Kind of looks like this. So we might have a feature here that's like a bucket of Legos, and then here's another, and another, and another. And as we're doing that feature and working with it, now this group over here, you know, you are self-contained. You get your own little bucket to work in. This group over here, you probably have no clue what this group's doing, but that's okay. All right, now maybe I'm the app module. Well, now all I have to worry about is just importing yours, importing yours, possibly lazy loading. But this is the problem they had. Uh, they didn't think about that up front. And then when I came in, the kind of question was, hey, it's starting to load slow. <laughs> and of course, what do people do when they don't know better? Oh, it's Angular's fault. No, when you're loading megabytes of JavaScript, that's not Angular's fault. <laughs> that's called bad design. So uh, we fixed it. They got it going pretty quickly, and we re-architected it so they could do lazy loading of the features on demand, and a lot of you have done that. That's not news. But this is a big deal that if you're not planning this up front, and for instance, if you had a customer's feature, at a minimum, I always have at least two modules per feature, at a minimum. A lot of times I also have sub-modules. Uh, for sub-features. So you might have your routing, possibly, in its own module, and then, of course, your feature module. And then, likewise, if we had orders, we might do something like the following here um, that you see. Now, this is pretty much straight from the style guide. And I will admit, the style guide is not the most exciting reading. I always say, that if you have problems sleeping at night, go ahead and just print that out, take it to bed, and you won't even need, like, sleeping pills or anything. You'll just be able to go right to sleep. But everybody should read the style guide if you haven't, because there's a lot of great recommendations about things like this. And they're really, really critical if your app especially is more enterprise uh, scale. Now, smaller apps, I'm gonna argue, you can get away with a lot. Uh, larger apps, not so much, especially when you have a lot of team members involved. So definitely something to plan for. Now, to kind of show that just a, a little bit, this is actually an application uh, that we use for some of our, uh, the training aspect of our company, and it runs uh, labs. And you're gonna notice I have this little markdown parser. This is something that the user would never see, but if you were an, an author of a lab, then you would see this. And you'll notice I have a markdown uh, component, and it's pretty simple overall. I have some components I'm grabbing from a routing module, and then I'm importing what I need, Pretty standard stuff, right? Well, a lot of folks, what I see them do, and, and I did this too when I first got started, to be real honest, 
is, you know, we just kind of tend to throw that in app module, and app module becomes the dumping ground. Probably not a good idea. In fact, in this case, if we go to this course here, here's my course routing module. Now, these are all, um, well, most of these are lazy loaded in here. And then I have some child routes you'll see at the bottom. And then here's my course module. All right, pretty standard stuff, nothing really fancy there. And then, of course, that's going to get imported into my app module here at the root. And we have in here our course module, well, right there, course module, and then you'll see several other modules. Now, this particular app has a lot of modules. Uh, I, I also think there is such a thing as over-architecture, though, and you don't want to go crazy. You know, I've heard some people go, oh, well, I'm going to make one module per component. Eh, good luck with that. I mean, why? You know, you probably don't need that, unless you're make, maybe uh, selling widgets or something like that. Maybe you do. But that's the, the type of thought process we want to go through. And usually what I'll do is I'll go to the whiteboard with a group, and we'll start specking out. I just draw little circles, and that represents the features. We'll start breaking those down into sub-features and start to architect this so that when this group here gets assigned feature A, and this group here gets assigned feature B, then everybody knows what we're doing. All right? We're not just leaving it like, all right, go code. <laughs> and then next thing you know, you have just this mess on your hands because nobody thought it through. So I would challenge you, if you're not doing that currently at your company, to uh, maybe think about doing that at your company. Now, the next thing that comes up is how do we structure components? And I probably get more questions on this or the next one we're going to cover than anything. The modules is pretty straightforward once you get the hang of it. When it comes to structuring components, though, if we have a parent with some children, who does the work? Does the parent do the work? Do the children do the work? If you have services, where do you inject the services? And what if these children have children and children? And earlier I had you raise your hand, who has a deep hierarchy of components? And those that raised your hand, you know, that can be really challenging because what ends up happening is people use an input to an input to an input to an input. And then when you want to go back up, it's an output to an output to an output to an output. And that gets really messy from an architecture standpoint and just app as a whole. Now, what we can do is follow a pattern called the container presenter pattern. And there's a couple tricks we can do with this that not only could improve performance, but will also make it where we as developers don't step on our own toes. Uh, you know, that, that's never a good thing. So a container component is basically the boss of the operation, and it would be responsible for injecting services and getting data and interacting with the Angular services. Now, what we will do then is our children will be what we'll call presentation components. And a presentation component's job in life is to render data or capture data from the end user. But the way we're going to do that is they will not be in charge of inserts, updates, deletes, things like that. They'll always report back up to the parent. And so by following this container presentation pattern, what we can do then is greatly simplify uh, the amount of code we have. So let me uh, jump on over here real quick to another project, just show you a couple things we can do with that. So if I come on in, we're going to look at communication next. You're going to see a component right here. And this is my uh, what we'll call container component that we're going to have. And this container component has two children, customers and details. Now, the app itself. Let me actually go back to here. All right, this is kind of what we have. So this is the container, the whole screen, if you will. All right, and then here's our children. But what's happening here is the boss, which is the container, is in charge of getting the data and then rendering that down to the children using input properties. Pretty standard, right? Then as we click on these, we're using output properties to go back up. OK, and that works great if you're pretty shallow. And by doing this, we no longer have a nightmare when it comes to working with and updating long-term maintenance. Because if this group over here is working with the container in the presentation, and that presentation ends up changing over time, and it's doing all the work, well, now people start to lose track of who updated what. And maintenance becomes a bit of a nightmare, or can. So we want to be really careful there. Now, if I go on back uh, to the code here, there's a couple things you can do that will help with this. So first off, we can come into the presentation component, and we can set this to on push. 
And with on push, now if the input property, which you'll see right there, changes, then yeah, the UI will update in the presentation component. If the output property, if we had one, fires, that would also cause it. And then there's a few DOM events that can cause it to refresh the UI. If I start coming into here, though, you know, for instance, in an ng on a init, if I had that, and I start coding right here changes to the customer data, what you'll find is the UI will not update because nothing was pushed in or pushed out. And so Angular, the change detection mechanism goes, I'm not supposed to do anything. Now, that's a good thing because in this container presentation kind of pattern we can follow, we want to make sure that one place, the container, is the source. And the children are just about rendering or capturing data and then reporting back up to the boss. Now, is this appropriate for every scenario? Of course not. There's, there's never anything that's appropriate for every scenario. I don't think such a thing exists in our world of software. However, this can really, really simplify long-term maintenance for you. And we're going to talk about when it gets a little more complex than just this, there's some other things you can do, but this is definitely a good pattern that uh, you can follow here. So basically, this becomes the boss. This one uh, down here, both these children are now in charge of presenting or capturing data. And then if we had output properties, you know, they can be notified the, the boss, if you will. Now we don't have confusion on where do we inject our services. Now, is it possible we might inject services here still? Yeah. I mean, you might have lookup table data. Who knows that you still need in that presentation. But when it comes to data operations, no, we're probably not going to do that here. Okay, if you do do that, that's probably not the container presentation. That's just parent-child that we would do. Now, I had somebody in the workshop yesterday ask, so is this appropriate for every scenario? And as I just mentioned, no, it's not. Uh, but in cases where you're starting to get confused, you have all these children, and you're coding. And uh, yesterday, I kind of joked, you know, have you ever had that scenario? where you're coding and you realize, I'm not sure I know what's really going on, but I'm going to keep coding anyway. Uh, and some of us have probably hit this before. And it's not that great of a feeling because you're just a little bit confused on, should I be updating this? Should the parent? Like, what are we doing? Well, that's a scenario where the container presentation could really help out, possibly. All right, so this is something we should plan for. Now, so a couple tips on this. So as you would expect in Angular, we're going to use input properties, pass data down. We use output for back up. And then we can set the on push in this pattern uh, for the change detection strategy. Now, by doing that again, I just had this come up uh, within the last six months where I was trying to update the code in a presentation component, could not figure out why the UI was not updating, only to scroll up and go, oh, Geez, you know, slap myself in the face. I had done an on push strategy. Okay, so I was trying to protect myself from myself, and it worked, as it didn't work, um, actually. Now, one big thing with this if you're passing arrays, objects, things like that down to the presentation, and you need ng on changes to fire, then if the outer object itself, the outer array, the outer object doesn't change, you know, what happens with ng on changes? it doesn't fire because it's a by ref check. So that's where you also might want to consider something with immutable data or possibly just cloning the data as we pass it from a container down to the child to make sure that all the necessary event hooks and things uh, fire appropriately. Uh, when I first first got started, not with Angular, but some earlier ones, you know, the concept of immutable data was really new. Uh, back then to me. And I'm like, why would I have immutable data? Well, here's a perfect example. If you start mutating the data up top and you add a new item to the array, for example, what's going to happen in the child? Nothing if you have an ng on changes, because an array item add by, de by default does not cause it to fire. And I'm sure some of you have probably run into this. So this is also something to plan for. And when we get to state management, we'll talk a little bit more. Now, the next thing comes up, um, and this is the question I get the most, actually, is, well, what happens if I'm doing container presentation, but then that presentation has another and another and another, and now we're back to this deep hierarchy that I talked about. What do we do there? Okay, well, there's not one right answer, but what we're going to talk about now is, I think, one of the more essential skills to have and to plan for in Angular Apps, and that is how are our components 
going to talk. Now, the obvious answer is, oh, we're going to use input-output properties. Okay, well, yeah, you could use input-output properties, but has anybody ever passed an input to an input to an input to an input, and then you got to go back up with an output, 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 output? Well, I call that the house of cards. It's like one developer blows on the house of cards and the whole thing falls down, right? Very, very difficult to maintain because if who's ever building the hierarchy breaks one link in the chain, it breaks the whole thing uh, for the most part. So what if we have this scenario? We have maybe a container presentation, maybe just parent children, and then we start adding more and more, and now I need data here, and I need data here, and I need data here. Now what happens? Well, one thing you could do is you could have subcontainers. That would be a, certainly a possibility where this is a container with the presentation. This then becomes a container for these presentation, and so you have these subcontainers. Now that may or may not be a good idea, but what happens if this one needs to notify this one or higher, so the bottom one needs to go all the way to the top, how do we do that? Okay, well, a lot of people would instantly gravitate to, oh, you use state management. Okay, well, that's totally a viable solution. You could, you could do that. But oftentimes there's an easier solution that doesn't require state management as a whole. Yes, we are managing state, but we just need a better way to communicate. And inputs and outputs, I'm going to argue in this case, are probably not a great idea. Okay, so for instance, what if we have this child component in this uh, feature component here, and it needs to talk all the way up to the nav bar or to the app component or something like that? Well, you know, depending on how deep it is, we could do the whole output, 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 output. Eh, probably not a good idea. Or we could create our own types of communication services, and we're going to briefly talk through two of these. One is more for just messaging between any layer of the application, any component, could talk to any other component in a very loosely coupled way. That's our event bus service. The other would be where we're going to use observability in Angular. In fact, both of these use that, but where I inject a service to you, all right, and then I also have that service in my component, I call some function on the service, and then you subscribe to an observable. Okay, we call that an observable service, or you might have heard subject in a service. Works extremely well for many, many scenarios. Now, the difference is an event bus is all about messaging from me to you through this, what we call mediator pattern, middleman. It's kind of like you have a friend who knows a friend, who has a dog who, no, we won't go that far, but you have a friend who knows a friend, and then I want to talk to them so I can talk to you, maybe, because maybe I don't know you right here, but I know you, and you know them. Well, that'd be the mediator pattern. That's an event bus. That's just a messaging system. The other one is actually going to have functionality. This observable service here is going to have functionality in it to not only process some data, but also notify all of you if you subscribe. All right, and we call, I like to call this an observable service. So an event bus is very loosely coupled, whereas an observable service does some work, but then when that work is done or while it's being done, it can send out notifications. Again, this is one of those things we need to plan for initially in our application, though. Uh, a lot of you probably have hit the scenario where you have the deeply nested, like this component structure, and then you go, boy, how do I talk all the way up to the top? Well, using these techniques, you could do it. So before we jump into the, the next piece here, let's jump on over. And let me show you an example of kind of how to think about this. So first off, let me go over to subjects here. So with this observable service or with an event bus, you can use a RxJS subject. And if you haven't used a subject before, there's several of them. Uh, one is called just subject, and if you want data from the subject, you have to subscribe to the subject. If you forgot to subscribe, you get nothing. The next one, second one over, is behavior subject. Okay, now this is where you subscribe later, but you get the last piece of data instantly as soon as you subscribe. So instead of getting nothing as soon as you subscribe, it kind of updates you. The next one is, what if a bunch of things happened and you want to know about all of these things? Well, this would be what we call a replay subject. Now, this would be you uh, over here, let's say, are subscribed, 
and I sent out A, B, C, and you get all that. Now, you over here, you subscribed about five seconds later, let's say. Well, what's going to happen with behavior subject is you would get C, right? You'd miss out on the A and the B. However, with the replay subject, I can now replay everything that happened as soon as you subscribe over here. So they got ABC, you now get ABC. Okay, and that'd be a replay subject. In fact, a behavior subject is really just a replay subject of one. It just replays the last item. Now, the last one is called an async subject, and the async subject basically emits, emits, emits. But in this one, you don't actually get data until it completes. So you subscribe, and it's sending, sending, but you don't get that data. But then when it says, okay, I'm done, it's kind of like saying, give me the last piece of data that was emitted. Now, to kind of show this in action, what I have here in this app is a set of these different subjects. You would never do this in one app, but it's good for demos. And I'm going to start, hit that little start button here. That's going to immediately subscribe to the subject, or after about two seconds, I think, something like that. Then a few seconds later, behavior subject's going to subscribe. Then a few seconds later, replay subject's going to subscribe. And then finally, async subject. Now, you'll see that subject here is now started. And watch, it's going to start getting data. So there we go. In fact, I can probably make this a little bigger. Not that big. OK, now notice behavior subject subscribed later, but it did pick up two. Replay subject got everything, because I set it to replay everything. And then async subject, that one just completed. And the last piece of data was the six. So they're all now going to stay in sync, although this one over to the right is now done, uh, because it only got the last piece of data. Now, why would you care about these? Well, here's why. When it comes to communication, let's say that you have a component where the user can add a customer. And that adds it to this grid that you see right here. All right, so I'm going to push it. Now, watch up here to the top. You'll notice I have a little counter. It's going to show us how many customers we have. So I'm going to go ahead and push. And notice up here to the right, it went to four. OK, nothing earth shattering. But this is now talking up many levels in the app simply by injecting this one of these two types of services, an event bus or an observable service. And now we can easily talk to any part of the app. No fancy state management solution required. It's very straightforward. And I think this is very appropriate for different scenarios. Now I'll push another one, and it updates you know, in the top right there. Now likewise, when I click on one of these, the details are going to show. But let's say that the user also wants the customer name to show right kind of up in here somewhere. Okay, So I'll click on John Doe, and there we go. We have the uh, current customer, and here, and here, and you get the idea. Now again, I could have done this with output, 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 or I could keep it super simple, architect it appropriately, and just leverage what's built into Angular. Use an RxJS subject, either subject, behavior subject, async subject, or replay subject. And then now we can communicate. Now, I won't have time to go through all the projects here, but uh, for those that are interested, there is a project up on GitHub. And it's going to have these different types of services in it. Let me just show you real quick. So you'll notice an event bus service. Okay, this is a very simple way to subscribe to a particular type of event, like customer inserted, customer deleted. And then I also have one, if I go to data service here, and this is going to use a behavior subject to allow us to subscribe to customers that we might have. Now, in this case, you would subscribe to this customer's change. The dollar is optional. I, I like it for observable streams, but you don't have to do that if you don't want. Now, any component, including the root level component, can come in and do one of these two things. Now, you wouldn't do both, more than likely. You'd pick kind of one of these. I could either subscribe to events. Now, this is a very loosely coupled way to say, on this event firing, give me that data, that customer I clicked on. Okay? Or if you don't want just a messaging service, which is all the event bus is, it's just a way I pass data to you, you then, can, it's like a hot potato, we call it in the US, you just hot potato that over to whoever subscribed. So it's just a way to talk. Now this one actually, this data service here could be a regular service. And maybe every time the data service inserts a customer, 
you want others in the app, anywhere in the app, to be able to subscribe to, get that customer. Okay, well, that's what you could do here. And of course, you could use async pipe. You don't have to do the subscribe. Uh, in fact, I like async pipe, but that's, that would be two options. Now, that'll be in this example. I'll have a link at the end that if you want to get to, there's quite a bit actually in this project. Uh, we only have time to touch on the basics, but uh, we'll come back to that a little bit. All right, so now another thing that we really need to architect for is uh, state management. I think this is probably, at least from what I'm seeing on different teams, the number one area where it's, it's almost like the, uh, you need to choose really wisely what is best for your team. Uh, some of you are probably using NGRX, which is phenomenal. And I think it's great if the team, and I'm, I'm gonna add a big if here, if the whole team understands the pattern. They understand actions and the payload that's being sent and the reducers and effects, and they understand how this works. Uh, yesterday, I told those that were here, I told you a quick story about, it's a big credit card company that you would have heard of that we were working with. And uh, one of the developers, came to me and said, well, I asked him, how's it going? He goes, you know, honestly, I'm just copying and pasting and renaming things. And I don't actually know what it's doing. <laughs> and I'm like, hmm, that's probably not good. <laughs> so, and it was just a matter of education. I mean, obviously, anybody can learn this. Um, for them, the pattern in this app was overkill, to be honest. Uh, they didn't really need it. Uh, so we kind of talked about that and, um, you know, went from there. This is one of those areas, though, that I think you seriously need to evaluate. First off, does your app need state management? Maybe your app, every time the user clicks a button, deletes from the database, updates in the database, does something like that, or sends it to a message queue or whatever it may be. Well, in that case, there's not a lot of state being tracked on the, uh, the, the browser in the front end. And... If you need a state change to be, you know, a notification to be sent out, well, we just talked about observable services, an event bus. You could use one of those two options, you know, if you want it. Now, is that to say you don't need state management? Oh, no. Oh, no. The app I first showed you, the lab app, that is heavy, heavy, heavy state management. Without a state management solution, that app would be an absolute nightmare to maintain. So observable service and services in general, I think are a great way to start, right? You have a service, it's injected, okay, easy peasy, right? Then we have a component with another service. Okay, still pretty easy to maintain, and then we keep going here, but here's where the problem comes in. What happens when that service is injected here and that service is injected here and now the component calls, where's the source of the update happening? And some of you have probably hit this where you get that confusion feeling going, huh, am I supposed to do this? <laughs> Is this being some, done somewhere else? Uh, you know, what's going on here? So the answer to that, of course, is we go in and we have the services talk to a store, a centralized place to store the data. And then that store probably provides change notifications of some type. You know, with NGRX, you have your different selectors and the stuff behind that. Uh, there's others we're going to talk about coming up here shortly as well. But now all those services can talk to that store, and we're uh, pretty good to go there on what we want to do here, which works out really well. So when it comes to state management, there is no shortage of options. Um, in fact, yesterday I asked the question in the workshop, and I said, hey, who's using this? And I had about three people. Who's using this? And one person. You know, and I think almost everything I'm going to show you, somebody was using, just about. There's not one size fits all. I think it's very, very important that you evaluate your team's skills. You evaluate what type of state management do we need. Do we need a pattern? Because if you do, things like NGRX are phenomenal because your code looks like my code. You're going to write actions and reducers, uh, effects, things like that. It's very predictable. I love that. Okay, but I'm also going to argue that there are cases where that might not be what your app needs. And that's kind of what we're going to talk through. So I like to start with just services and maybe even an observable service. We just talked about that. That's where you have that subject inside of a service. I think that's a great way to start. As soon as that service, though, tracks data, stores data, and then another service stores data, and another, and another, and another, okay, now we got a problem. 
right? We have data scattered all over the place and we're, we've lost control of our application. Well, that's where something like NGRX, there's a really simple way to start with NGRX, which is now part of NGRX, uh, called NGRX Data. Uh, a good friend of mine, uh, Ward Bell and John Papa, they actually kind of started this. Ward was the main, I think he's still probably contributing. I don't know, Mike's, I'd have to ask Mike back here. But uh, this is a really easy way, if you haven't heard about it, to get started with NGRX. It is NGRX. They just add a bunch of wrappers so that you don't have to worry about knowing everything about an action and a reducer and all that fun stuff. So it's, it's pretty cool, actually. It really minimizes the amount of code you have to write. Now, I uh, often use a project I have up on GitHub and on NPM called Observable Store. This is really just a subject in a service or an observable service, as I like to call it, with some extra bells and whistles around it for things like I want to track history of the state changes. Okay, I would like notifications. I want immutable data in the store. All those types of things, but about as simple as you could do. In fact, you can get this one going in, uh, gosh, I don't know, maybe 60 seconds? Fast as you can do the NPM install. About three lines of code to get started, so it's pretty basic. Uh, but there's others. There's uh, MobX. Some of you might have heard of Akita, NGXS. And we can go on and on and on. My point of this is you really do need to research what's best for your group. And when the app is starting and you're in that boardroom doing the planning we talked about, what's going to be best for your team? Um, there's a company I work with in the U.S. who's a huge shipping company. And they've hired at least 200 developers, purely Angular developers, uh, over the last uh, year, year and a half or so. Well, for them to jump into a more complex solution, it was just too much. They're still learning Angular, and they're pretty junior. Most of them are right out of school, so they're pretty new. Uh, very excited, though, and uh, super smart, by the way. But for them, it just wasn't an option to go super complex on state management because they're still kind of fighting learning about just communication techniques and how do we structure components and things like that. Okay, so when you're in that scenario, I think you really need to uh, look into it. Now, in this project I have that you can get to on GitHub, I'll show you at the end here, uh, in the kind of root of it, let me close this up, there's going to be a state management section. And this only has three of them, but it creates the same app three ways. One with NGRX, one with NGRX data, and one with observ observable store. Now, I'll admit it's a, it's a pretty straightforward app. It's not going to be this big enterprise app, but it's a great way, especially if you're trying to compare these options, to look at these. And, you know, who knows? Maybe someday I'll add some of those others in as well if I get some time to do that. But that's what we have as of uh, today. All right. Now, the last thing I want to go into is... When it comes to uh, building your Angular app, we all know the stories of something happens. And in fact, I was just talking to someone backstage about a client that was sending down just a ton of data down to Angular. And then they were complaining because Angular's slow. <laughs> and again, this, I mentioned this at the start of the talk. You know, how often have you heard that somebody say that and then you look what they're doing and you're like, that's not even right. <laughs> how can you say it's slow? You didn't even do it right. Well, that's where knowing about some of the different optimizations that are out there are really important. Now, a lot of these I hope you know about, but if you don't, we're going to mention a few. So the first that I have found in many, many cases, and one in particular is a big insurance company in the United States, and they had a mobile app, and they just could not figure out why this one screen was just super slow. Um, and they were smart enough to know that, yeah, it's probably something we did <laughs> versus blaming Angular, you know. Um, and so what ended up happening was they were making a ton of function calls from the template into the component. And some of you have probably done this. You know, it's super easy. You put your function. You then call the function in your interpolation bindings. You're kind of good to go, right? Super easy. Well, has anyone ever added just a simple console log into that function, you will be frightened. <laughs> okay, so we did this with them, and guess what they found? 
bam, 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 bam. Like every time the user blinked, it was like boom. You know, and then they blinked again, boom. Um, because what happens with a function is that as we're working with that function, Angular doesn't know which properties necessarily, well, they know what properties change, but they don't necessarily know what properties are used by that function. So every time something changes, they have to reevaluate the function because it could be using, you know, 10 properties. Who knows? It's kind of up to us. So one thing to really, really be aware of uh, is that functions are not going to be the most efficient option. Now, are they inappropriate or something? No. I mean, you probably won't even notice in many cases. They did because it was a lot of data in a grid, and every single row was causing that function to be reevaluated, reevaluated, reevaluated. So while I'm going to argue this isn't so much an architecture concept, I think it's one of those things as you're planning the app, you at a minimum need to let developers on your team know, hey, be careful of this, because it can get in the way. So with functions, there's no caching. It just has to keep calling the function. I'll run a demo here in just a sec and show you this. It turns out, though, if you replace those function calls with what we call pure pipes, where the same data always yields the same output, same parameters yields the same result, then we can really, really enhance performance because pipes, until the data changes, won't reevaluate the transform function, it turns out. And then we can even take it further, and there's some custom decorators out there, like one's called Memo Decorator, and memoizations for caching. And we could even make it where, hey, if these parameters are always the same, don't rerun the function, pull, pull that value from cache if I already have it. So we can actually run that function once, have this memoization decorator cache it, and then the next time we run it, it just pulls from cache. So it's just instant, very fast. Now that might look like this. Uh, this one is using something called memo decorator, and there's a few of these out there. This is just one I picked real quick for this demo. But you'll notice on my pipe here, everything's pretty much the same if you've ever written a custom pipe. But notice I have this memo decorator on it. Now, there's pros and cons to this. If you're passing in simple types, this works great. If you're passing in complex types into your pipe, such as a customer object, an order object, then you want to be a little more careful there. Okay, but let me show you an example of what I mean by this. So if we go back over to the uh, app, this kind of demo app here. I'm going to click on pipes and functions. Now, you'll notice I call a function from a template. That's going to calculate the total. So we're kind of imagining here that the data I was given from the service did not have the total calculated for every row. All right, pretty common. A lot of times you don't have that necessarily. So I'm going to have to calculate it. Now I'm going to do the same thing, but with a pure pipe. And then finally, one with a memo decorator with a pipe. All right, so let's uh, take a look here. I'm going to inspect. Let's make that a little bit bigger. You'll see my phenomenal responsive app. Oh, look at that. Look at that menu. It's amazing. Yeah, maybe not. Um, let's drag this up just a tad. And let me refresh. You can see even just moving things caused it to happen. Uh, OK, it's uh, unfortunately. OK, my internet did uh, not work, apparently. OK, that's OK. We can still see it. So take a look at this add tax function called. OK, well, there was 10 rows over here. Let's go back out. There was 10 rows right here. So yeah, it was called 10 times. That makes sense. OK, but then we have an add tax pipe was called 10 times. Well, that's this one. OK, well, that makes sense. There's 10 rows here. OK, but then we have add tax memo pipe called. Huh, well, what's different there? Well, notice. 269, 269, 32, 39, 32, 39. There was no reason to recalculate that because that value stayed the same across some of those rows. So the memoization would kick in. Now, we keep looking, though, and we go, wait a sec, add tax. Like, why is that running again? Well, it gets worse, folks. Let me go ahead and uh, come on into here. And, well, actually, let me go back to here. And now watch, let's clear the console, and I'm just going to update a property. Now, this is just a simple ng model, but even reactive would cause this to happen too. And I'm going to type a new product name, like I want to do a golf ball. Okay, G. Whoa, what? Like it just ran add tax 20 times. O, L, F. It's kind of crazy actually, right? 
And this is a simple little demo. Now, notice though, these, they never got recalled. Okay, not until, let me go ahead and let's do, uh, we'll do a golf ball, and we'll say price was pretty expensive golf ball, but we'll uh, clear this. Let's add the product here. All right, now notice this time, add tax pipe was called and add tax memo pipe. Well, yeah, because it's a new value, so it has to calculate a new total. But it was only called once. All right, so what we have there is we now have the ability to have way more control over what we're doing when it comes to rendering this in the template. So uh, I'll let you run that demo if you want a little bit later, but let's go ahead and uh, we'll wrap up here with just a couple more minor things. So the last thing I want to talk about on optimizations, and we could go on for hours on this, but is API calls. Uh, a lot of you have an API, and there's lots of APIs out there that you call, and the way we do that with HTTP client and our piping in ArcGIS can really impact performance. If we have a ton of APIs, and once one call comes back, we need to go call another, well, there's efficient ways we can do that. So the minimums are we need to know about switch map, merge map, concat map are good to know, and possibly fork join, because fork join would allow us to do some things in parallel if we wanted. Now, I won't uh, have time today to run that demo, but in the app, there's also a demo of these. And I guess my, my uh, advice here is if you're not familiar with these, at a bare minimum, if you're doing HTTP calls especially, you really should get comfortable with these four at a minimum. Now, of course, you need to know map and possibly tap and stuff like that. Um, but by doing this, you can make multiple API calls from a service, for example, way more efficient. And there's a, a demo of that. So to wrap up, first off, if you're not spending time, if your company does not really have a more robust planning process, I've given you the nine things at a minimum I like to do uh, in an application. In addition to that, take a feature-based approach and, and plan your modules. And think of it like Legos. You don't mix the X-Wing Lego set with the Death Star Lego set. That would be bad, right? And that's the same thing with Legos. Legos are components or services, and we want to make sure we organize those appropriately. It's the same premise. Uh, leverage observables. We had several talks uh, today that have brought that up, and uh, there's a lot of great things you can do there. And then when it comes to state management, don't assume that because, you know, Dan or whoever you heard said we should use this, that that's appropriate for your app. Uh, I've had several companies where they had to do a U-turn. <laughs> they kind of went this way and went, oh, nope, wrong choice, and whoop, went backwards and had to turn around. All right, and then uh, pick the appropriate solution for your app, of course, based on what I mentioned. And then last one, make sure you know about some of these optimizations, whether it's RxJS operators, uh, the pipes, which is a very simple concept, but powerful if you don't know about it. And we could go on and on and on. So with that, thank you so much. Uh, first off, before I wrap up, I want to, uh, Leonardo and the, the crew that put this on did a phenomenal job. So let's give them a round of applause first.